That's good. You're lucky. Yeah, I am. Thank, thank you, guys. So, um, you're ready to roll? Yeah, where, where are we starting? Page 79? Yeah, we're starting on page 79. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, all pearls and precious stones. <clears throat> Go ahead, Zev, and read the note. 79, uh, note 72. Note 72, all pearls and precious stones. The beginning of this passage is missing, both in the manuscripts and printed editions. Two spiritual messengers are describing to Rabbi Shimon the heavenly temple and the future coming of the Messiah. On the two messengers, see below note 134. In this description, the Garden of Eden is assimilated into the restored temple in Jerusalem or the idealized temple in heavenly Jerusalem. This accords with the Midrashic tradition that the gate of the Garden of Eden is adjacent to Mount Moriah. Okay. Among all those towers, there is one tower in the middle. This one rises to the height of heaven and is not visible now. So, um, This, this image of, of Jerusalem and, uh, and the temple being the center of the world or the center of the tower, so to speak, and yet the highest and not even seen now. Um, it's the hidden temple in the time of exile. And we assume we're talking about the Yushalayim of above that corresponds to the usual I am of below. I think that the, the Gemara tells us that God doesn't even enter the, Jeru the, the, the Jerusalem or the temple of above until he enters the other one, meaning it's the, the, the parallel temples are only activated by one another. So until the time when it will be revealed, the head of the academy saw it and engraved on it above was this verse in Proverbs. The name of Havaya, Yudke Vapke, is a tower of strength. The righteous one runs into it and is secure. So on a literal level, it just means that God's name is like a tower. And how does a righteous person protect himself from the vicissitudes of 2020? They run into this tower, which is God's name, and then they're safe there. But we'll see that the Zohar has a different explanation. The head of the academy explained this verse. The name of God, Yudke Vavke, is a re reference to Assembly of Israel, which is also known as the Shekhinah, the divine presence. I see Ben has just uh, joined us. Ben? Hi, uh, sorry about that. Okay, so we are now literally in the beginning of 164B. Uh, I'm on my mobile, so I may be a little, I'm trying to figure out how to, one second. Uh, I'm just trying to get out of the vortex, apparently. You know, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I just don't know how to. Oh, maybe I got it. You can still hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now I just got to get the czar. Sorry about this. Uh, Zohar, Zohar. So you're not in Hawaii? 
No, I'm not in Hawaii, but because I forgot, I, um, I'm like not sitting in a regular, like I'm on the road a little. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, Kabola. One sixty four B, the righteous ones. Well, it just quoted the Pasuk. And then it's the Yarutz runs into Ruta, the desire of sixty four B. This is what parasha? The Rav Masifta, and it's in it's the same section we've been doing, it's in Parsha Shla. Okay, okay, I got it. One sixty four B. Right in the oh, Boyer, it's tzaddik. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Right. Okay, the perfect. righteous one, because the the pasuk said that the uh, the righteous one runs into it, the tower, which is based on the name of Hashem. Yarutz runs into it, Ruute, which is desire, the desire of. Go ahead, read that. One sec. I think I'm Boyer, it's tzaddik, beman, bemigdal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, I got it. It's a little bit before that. Okay. It is, it is secure, the tower, so that it will never fall as it did. So again, there's a, vul there, there's a vulnerability of the base of Mikdash. It fell twice. So what's the security of the third and what we say, the final temple that will be forever. So he says it's a relationship between the righteous one that runs into it with desire that's constant, or, or righteous one that has a consistent that has a consistent quality to it, and therefore it's secure. So, so basically, now what we're going to say is a theme of throughout the Zohar that Galut is the disintegration of the Yichud, of the, of the unification between the Holy One, Blessed Be Anpin, and Shechina, uh, and, and, the, and the Divine Feminine. The Divine Feminine here is, is uh, Yud Kei Vavke, is the name of God, even though often the name of God is usually associated with Tiferet, in this case it's associated with with the Malchut, and the Tzadik is standing for the for the Mida, the attribute of Yisod, which is the the male um, part that brings the other elements of Zer Ampen Chesed through Yisod into contact and relationship with Shechina, with Malchut. So it's through, and, and, and what is that? That's desire. The Yisod creates the desire. But the desire that was till now inconsistent now has become consistent and therefore the Beit HaMegash will be forever. Okay, go ahead, read note 73, Zev. Among all those towers, <clears throat> the central tower in the heavenly temple is engraved with a verse from Proverbs, explained here by the head of the heavenly academy. Shechina, known as Assembly of Israel, is pictured as the name of Avaya, re um, revealing his presence in the world. She is also a tower of strength. Yesod, known as Righteous One, uh, constantly desires to unite with Shechina to run into this tower. Obviously, according to the simple sense of the verse, it is the righteous one who is secure, but the head of the assembly indicates that the tower symbolizing Shrina is secure, meaning that she will not fall again, as she did metaphorically when the temple was destroyed. See Talmud in Brachas, uh, fallen not to rise again as virgin Israel. Um, um, 
uh, Lin fall, uh, she has fallen and she will not fall again. Rise, virgin. The, the verse in Proverbs reads, the name of Havaya is a tower of strength. The righteous one, Boyarutz, runs into it or runs in it. Uh, Veniskav and is secure literally and is elevated. Here, the head of the academy associates with uh, Yarutz runs with Ratzon, desire, by mentioning the Aramaic word uh, Reute, his desire. On the tower, see below note 80. Okay, back to the main star. Abek Kruspadai. Abek Kruspadai Chamed Libo. Desire. Before he passed away, and he explained it well. Migdal Oz, Dateva, the Sevator de Iho Oz. The Tower of Strength, that's the Teva, that's the uh, place we put the Torah on usually, or, or the um, pulpit, and the Torah scroll, which which is strength to be placed on it and take it. The ark image of the inner Hechel from which emerges Torah. The tower is the name of UK Vavke. Image and it must have six steps. Why don't you read note 74, Zev? Oh, Rabbi Kruspida, his illness uh, and his heavenly visions are described in Zohar Chadash. Here, Rabbi Kruspida offers a related interpretation of the verse in Proverbs. The tower still symbolizes Shrina, who is also the name of Havaya. He adds that this tower is the Teva, the pulpit. Uh, or elevated reading desk on which is placed the Torah scroll, which is pictured as strength. Torah symbolizes Tiferes, who is placed on Shrina. The earth Hechal, Hechal arc corresponds to the inner Hechal, uh, which here may signify the abode of the Messiah, as in Seder Gan Eden, possibly by Moshe Tlion. Alternatively, uh, the inner Hechal refers to Bina, from whom Tifera, from whom emerges Tifera, symbolized by Torah. The tower symbolizing Shrina is the image of Tifera, known as Havaya, and its uh, six steps represent six aspects of Shrina, or her six camps of angels. In classic rabbinic literature, the term Teva means ark, chest, but here it refers to the pulpit, or elevated reading desk. The pulpit, commonly known as a bima, derived from Greek Bama raised platform, which itself may have derived from the Phoenician cognate of Hebrew Bama, a high place uh, or a cult site. Uh, in medieval Spain, the pulpit was a wooden platform placed high above the ground on columns. As here in the Zohar, it was called Migdal, a tower. In fact, already in Nehemiah 8.4, the term Migdal signifies a wooden platform from which the Torah was publicly read. The term Hechal means temple, sanctuary, palace, chamber, and in medieval Sephardic usage, also Ark, which was sometimes a special small room attached to the synagogue. Um, see in Idra Rabba, it, it gives some, some, some uh, uh, references in Idra Rabba and elsewhere. The concluding sentence refers to the six steps leading to the pulpit, which correspond to the six steps leading to Solomon's throne, uh, which symbolize Shrina. On Torah as strength, see a number of sources. Okay, great, thank you. So now we are- Rabbi, can I just add a little something here? Um, that this, it, this totally relates to um, um, the bit in Vayechel uh, where um, you read it every time when you take the ark, um, when you take the Torah out of the ark, and there's this, uh, what, what's it called? Um, um, when you, you finish chanting, you open the Torah doors, 
and then there's a portion from the from the Zohar that you read very quickly, and then um, uh, it, it finishes with, with Be and our Rachets, um, and then you know before you then you take the Torah into your hands, and there's this whole explanation in Vayechel that so may indeed come from um, Idra Rabba, where um, you're um, uh, specifically where you're taking the Torah scroll where it's almost like that there are six steps or something like that and um, almost like the Torah comes to meet you or the, the Torah of being God come, comes to meet you on the third step and then you or Moses um, take the Torah from that third step and bring it to the reader's table and, um, um, and I, I, I guess it must be in volume um, in volume three or four, but um, this is all something that um, uh, I had actually interaction a few years ago with Danny Matt about because I gave a talk about. I remember it. when you were preparing that. Yeah, it was like I, I was. It was a wild goose chase. But um, yeah. anyway, I'm sorry. No, That's no. right. There's a lot. This is a very beautiful. Um, David's talking about some other beautiful sections of the Zohar that like really fit in very well with this. Um, so, including the section that, that we read when we take the Torah out of the Ark, the Birshmei. Birshmei, that's what I mean. it's Birshmei, right, sorry. Yeah. So it's great stuff, it's great stuff. There's a lot, there's a lot here. Um, but let's, let's go a little further. Um, it's interesting because Dafiomi just started a uh, Mesechtas Erevin, and the first daf is dedicated to this discussion about the the door, the height of the of the entranceway of the Heichal, one of the words that's frequently used right in this passage, uh, versus the height of the entranceway to the Ulam. The, the height for the Heichal is twenty amot. The one for the Ulam is forty amot. And that's offered as the first kind of explanation of a debate in the Mishnah, in the first Mishnah, about what height this cross beam, this, this Korah, has to be with, within, 20, within 20 amot uh, or, or, or within 40 amot. Or 20, or, and, and, and it's based on this kind of design of the temple. So the idea here is that every, every little element of the design of the temple signifies a relationship with a particular sefirot. So very much so the following thing that we just read. Um, we'll see that in note 75. So let's read this next thing and, and great stuff, the, which is hard, especially this year, you know. Um, yeah, the righteous one runs into it. What does he run into the tzaddik? Into the Torah, into the tower, or in the to or in the, which which one is he running into? Is he running into the, the tower or the Torah scroll? Well, he expounded the verse in this way and in that way, both ways. When he interpreted it as in running into the tower, then the tzaddik, the righteous one, must be the chazan of the synagogue. Truly righteous, and the image of this, the heavenly righteous one, tzaddik. The other commentary that interprets it to be referring to the Torah scroll must be the one reading must be righteous and is called righteous. So it's, a, it's both Pirushim, both comments are commented on and that it could be the Chazan and or the Torah reader. Okay, why don't you read note 75? It's about 75. Yeah, it's the righteous. One. Yeah, the righteous one runs into it. If it refers to the tower, then the righteous one is the chazan of the synagogue. 
who leads the prayers at the Teva, elevated reading desk, which is called a tower. He symbolizes Yesod, known as Righteous One. If it refers to the Torah scroll, then whoever runs, i.e. reads fluently in this scroll in the synagogue must be righteous, again corresponding to Yesod. In rabbinic literature, the term chazan of the synagogue refers to the official who performs various duties there. In post-Talmudic times, the term, term chazan specifically refers specifically to one who chants the prayers. On running as reading fluently, see Habakkuk 2.2, 2, as mentioned above, uh, the verse in Proverbs reads, the name of Havaya is a tower of strength. The righteous one runs into it and is secure. Okay, great. Page 81. Ready, uh, Dan? Yeah. Um, the tzaddik ikre man ikre tzaddik mikulhu. Of all of them, who was called righteous? Shiti sa the tzaddik meinun sheva. The sixth one, ascending amo, among those seven. Okay, let's go a little further and then we'll read the note. Amar Rabbi Shimon Vadai, the Iulo Sala Kalyomai. Rabbi Shimon said, certainly, for all his life he ascended, he got the sixth Aliyah. Only uh, the amongst those ascending. That's why there's a custom, people try to get the sixth Aliyah, it's based on this. Zohar that uh, Arizal took quite literally always made it a point to get the sixth Aliyah. Okay. Maybe the third one, which like the Lithuanians do, is because of like what David said. Well, well, the, I mean, what, the third one's really the first one, you know. For, yeah. <laughs> did, did, didn't, didn't the Rebbe always take the, the third one? Um, the Rebbe used to actually often take Mahdir or the third one. So in different circles, there's some some circles it's the third aliyah, other circles it's the sixth aliyah, other circles it's it's Mahdir. They're all the best depending on who you're you know who you're following. Okay. Well, clearly, the second aliyah is the best. <laughs> well, you have to put it this way: the reason why the third is the best is because it's the first one that's available to a non Cohen or Levy, you know? So that would make the first or second even better. <laughs> so, no. Okay. The Cohen and the Levy get that. Quite a few. We've got Ted and... and uh, Sounds Dave. like a contest. Dad. <laughs> Reb Shimon said, surely for all his life he has said, yeah, the righteous one runs in it, in the Torah scroll, runs the words of this righteous one. Why don't, why don't we read note 76 and 77? 76, um, of all of them, of the seven people called up to chant from the Torah, the sixth corresponds to the sixth of the seven, Lower Spirot, Yesod, known as righteous one. 77 is on all his life. He ascended only sixth. Rabbi Krispidai insisted on always being called up uh, as the sixth one to the Torah. As this righteous one uh, chanted from the Torah scroll, he read fluently his words running in it. <clears throat> Based on this account, he was it was considered a great honor to receive the sixth Aliyah. Vital writes about his teacher, Isaac Luria, I also saw that on every Shabbos day, he would go up to the Torah only at the sixth one. Um, citing, and, and he cites Rabbi Gerspedai there. Okay, we go back up to the text. Benisgav Miman. When you secure or elevated from what? Or who? Of the angel of death. For he has lived a long life. He lived a long life and is secure never to be. Okay. And you? And the tower rising among those towers stands a radiant in the image of a Torah scroll. When a bird or that bird comes, it takes the tower from its place. 
It sets it in the middle of the courtyard. Go Godfrey the Karuvim Hava. Beneath the wings of the Karuvim. Rume Lerum Shamaya Mayak Baal Tachos Hinon Karuvim. Whereas its height has reached the loft of heaven, it now descends, entering beneath those wings, its walls beneath the heads of the Karuvim. Okay, note 78 and 79. Sev. 78, from fear of the angel of death, as evidenced by Rabbi Chris Badai, who lived to an old age. Um, see elsewhere in Zohar on that. Uh, 79, in the tower rising, the spiritual messenger continues his description. See above note 72. A bird comes and takes this tower, setting it in the middle of the courtyard of the heavenly temple. On the tower, see above note 73. On the tower is a pulpit. We, we read those notes just now. The placement of the tower in the middle of the courtyard corresponds to the placement of the pulpit in the middle of the synagogue. See the Rambam and, and other sources about where, where the pulpit should be. Seb, have you sent um, further pages beyond this one? Yes, yes, they should be there by now. Let me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they're in there. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, we're going to continue then. Halas mea piskin taman, the pisco dem sa isa, kaiman hirada. Openings there, and the middle op oh, in the middle opening stands this radiance, image of a Torah scroll. And you with this Torah base, they zaman melchisra, the nikre of parshas hakel. Destined to read the port portion of hakel of gathering the Jews together to hear the Torah being read in the seventh end of the seventh year. This will be the King Mashiach, not just any king, this will be the King Mashiach and no other. And in the Torah scroll of Radiance, okay. Page eighty-two. Second. I'm um, let's see. I'm just trying to open up the. Uh... Yeah, if you if you reload the the page, should be there. Okay, page eighty-two or eighty-three. 82. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. A holy, pious one. Happy is the one who will hear from his mouth the lovely sounds of his words of these hidden matters of Torah that he explains on every new moon, Shabbos, festival, and holiday, when all those members of the academies wish to ascend on high to the heavenly academy, they all gather around the King Mashiach, and he explains matters, and through the sweetness of his words, they ascend yearning. All those 10 matters amongst the matters that he explains are treasured away for you for the day that you have questions, for the day that you have questions. Okay. Ben, what happened to you? No, I don't know. You, you read, so I just kept quiet, but I could read it. So, um, uh, let's see where you started. Uh, the Torah is treasured away for the day that you have questions. Uh, the Torah is treasured away for the day that you have questions. Uh, the Torah is treasured away for the day that you have questions. Uh, the Torah is treasured away for the day that you have questions. Uh, the Torah is treasured away for the day that you have questions. Uh, the Torah is treasured away for the day that you have questions. Uh, the Torah is treasured away for the day that you have questions. Uh, the Torah is treasured away for the day Genizen, Lach, Meinon, Milan, Diu, Parish, Leomedish, Alton, Dilach. Can you go on or notes? Now we'll do the notes. Okay, so that's 80 and 81. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, 80, 300 openings in that tower. According to Deuteronomy, every seven years on the festival of Sukkot, this Torah referring to the portion, portions or all of Deuteronomy was, uh, read, was to be read publicly. The Mishnah 
in Sota stipulates that the king of Israel should perform the reading, uh, consisting of various passages from Deuteronomy. Here the Zohar indicates that the king was to read specifically uh, the portion uh, uh, Hakel, um, assemble, which refers to the which refers to Deuteronomy itself. Furthermore, the king of Israel now refers to King Messiah, who chants from the heavenly radiant Torah scroll. The association of the number 300 with the tower recalls the Talmudic passage um, in Chagiga and Sanhedrin, where the phrase counter, counter of the towers from Isaiah is interpreted as one who counted 300 fixed laws concerning a tower flying in the air. Right. This obscure image apparently refers to a tower-shaped chest or vehicle, perhaps not directly touching the ground, but supported by posts. The 300 laws that are related to the ritual purity or impurity of the contents of the tower. On the flying tower, see elsewhere in Zohar. Okay, yeah, it's great stuff. Yeah, but there's like a string that connects or something like a really narrow. 81, holy pious one. The spiritual messenger addresses Rabbi Shimon describing how King Messiah will chant from the Torah and explain its deeper meaning. When Rabbi Shimon eventually asks questions about many of these secrets, answers will be provided. On holy days, the souls dwelling in the academies of the, gar of the earthly Garden of Eden ascend to the heavenly academy headed by Metatra. See elsewhere. Thank you. Okay. Uh, timer. To when the tower stands in the middle of the courtyard. And this aperture opens. Those open their mouth and they spread their wings. The eternal radiance radiates or illumines the opening and that Torah scroll is open. Okay, so the Torah scroll is open, the Kruvim opens saying, how abundant is your goodness that you have hidden for those who revere you, that you for those who shelter in you before the eyes of humankind. Psalms 3120. Sagiru, so Sagiru. And openings close. The Sefer Torah is glow. And the Torah scroll is rolled up. One, let's read the last little paragraph on this page. Who has that Torah scroll? All luminous light. Kule Nahor Denar, Aswan Delay, Shalhove de Esha Midalga. Flames of fire in four colors of the supernal world. No one can endure them except Mashiach. To, uh, we'll do, we'll do 82 and 83. Uh, this aperture opens. Middle opening of the tower mentioned above at note 80. And 83 is on the four colors of the supernal world. White, red, green, and blue, corresponding respectively to Chesed, Gvor, Tiferes, and Shrina. Uh, on protruding and sparkling letters, see elsewhere in Zohar. Um, the phrase can endure them renders uh, uh, Lemekam Beho, which can also be translated as can fathom them. Okay. Is this saying that? Um, this is occurring or has occurred, and Mashiach is the only one who is able to contemplate or survive or coexist uh, or fathom these lights, or that's what will happen, and perhaps it will, it will be one of the maybe signs or proofs that the one who can, who can um, uh, deal with this type of uh, revelation is the Mashiach. Um, I mean, 
I don't think it's like Rambam or Gemara, like here's the signs that you're going to need to know that you'll be able to tell who Mashiach is. But other than that, yes. You know what I mean? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I guess so there is, is it saying something that happened already or saying something that will happen? Or just like a reality, like this is the reality, this strength of revelation of Torah with fire and all these colors, that's a Mashiach experience, not for anyone else. I, it, it, has, it, has, it has to be talking about how the mundane, everyday aspect of what happens when the Torah comes out or the Monday, Thursday and Shabbos and uh, holiday experiences when the Torah comes out is a little portion of what will happen on that great Shabbos when Rashir finally comes. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question because and it, 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 what, what David is referring to is it starts off this page by saying, on every new moon Shabbos festival and holidays, meaning all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. right. Then it says at the end, you know, this is for Mashiach size only. Right, so then it's it's like it's like Shabbat itself is just a scintilla of the ultimate Shabbat, and this itself is also in the Torah aspect of it, our experience, whatever we are getting or you know in in, in envisioning through our interaction with the Torah is also maybe a microcosm or a scintilla of what the ultimate experience that Mashiach will. Yeah. Or is, is happening, but it's sort of happening on a Mashiach plane and our plane, and there's multiple things at different levels happening all at the same time, depending on who you are. It could be happening now, and ultimately, you know, Mashiach will bring it, will help facilitate this. Democratize, democratize it for everyone, or at least democratize it into time that we're into our time. Well, nope. up to 83. You, you don't want to tell this to Yehuda, Rabbi, because it's going to go to his head. About the Chazan part? Yeah. <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to give you major oh, problems. Ray or the Chazan. <laughs> you can't tell Peter either, because Peter, <laughs> his, the Chazan used to be more like what we call the Shamish today, you know? Right. But that, I think that's why it says it's one or the other, not both, because you can tell each. You never give one person both. It's like whenever you have a scenario when someone does all of them, it's like, ah, oh, that by, you know, they're sort of like hogging it. Because then you can't just tell them, no, it's not you. You're not the tzaddik. It's the other one. And then the same thing you tell the other one. It's, it's yeah. the other guy who's the tzaddik. Wasn't the Baal Shem Tov, before he revealed himself, really the uh, Shamus of the synagogue? Um, yeah, I think so, yeah. I think he was a caretaker of something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Balshanto had some communal roles that he took, um, including being the, the the teacher's apprentice as well, and that might have included some shamish duties. Okay, let's continue. Are we on page eighty-three now, or do we have to read any of the notes? Yeah, at the top. Okay. Uh, you want to just read note 8283, Zev? Well, we got 8283 already. Okay. That's, yeah, that's where we were. Okay, so the opening closes then, 83. Uh, and the crew subside, and that tower flies, taking its place amongst the rest of the towers. Gary, I'm sorry, one second. I'm having a loading. Uh, one second. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay, the Parach, the Kaiba of Bahu Pischadem to Isa. The opening clap closes, the Kerubim subside, and the tower flies, taking its place amongst the rest of the towers. 
in the middle opening is a crown of pure gold, splendid, precious, hidden, invisible now, inlaid and embedded. The lowest, the lowest has a hashtag, Galifa umuchukaka b'chol zine abne yakar uzamina l'mehevi al reisha d'malka mashiach. Destined to be placed upon the head of the King Mashiach when he ascends the tower. Side, grasp it in their tal talons. Go on when King Mashiach will ascend. The eagles will ready themselves, taking his crown. Remember, it's all that reading the Torah. Another aperture will open from which will emerge the dove sent of the flood. The shadow now be made of fun of Siva Yashalaka Sayona. Hayona Hahi de Ishtima de Ishtimo de A. The low Malilu Ba Kadmoi. Not the dove, as it says in Genesis, right? The renowned one, which the ancient ones did not mention and whose identity they did not know. And fulfilled her mission. Okay, let's read notes 85. Zev? Zev? I thought I was uh, unmuted there. Okay, 85. Uh, when King Messiah will ascend the tower. When he begins to chant from the Radiant Torah Scroll, a dove will emerge. This dove, who now plays a messianic role, is the very same one sent out by Noah from the Ark. He sent out the dove to see whether the waters had abated from the surface of the ground. According to the Zohar, by specifying the dove, scripture alludes to this renowned bird who went forth on her mission uh, for Noah for, uh, from this heavenly tower. On the messianic role of the dove compared to the New Testament, where it says in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. When he came up out of the water, immediately he saw uh, the heavens open and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, so on and so forth. Chagiga, in the name of Benzoma, says, I was gazing between the upper waters and the lower waters, and there is merely three fingers' breadth between them. As it is said, the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters, like a dove hovering over her young without touching them. Mm -hmm. why, why, would, why is Daddy Matt uh, inter... I don't know, connecting this to the New Testament and Jesus. Is, it, is the Zohar referring to that here? No, Danny Matt likes to do comparative I, movements. I mean, and, and the thing is, so he's he's referencing Mark, which is the only gospel that was written by a Jew. So, I, like, it's not that Mark invented the idea that a dove was yeah, connected to the yeah, symbol of Mashiach. borrowed a biblical idea from Genesis. Exactly. Not like they, you know, just could... They appropriated it doesn't make it theirs. You know what I mean? Uh, that's why I use an image of a dough for our annual newsletter. I didn't feel like, I know that most people associate it with Christianity, but it, it's it's that's not true. Meaning they might use it a lot, but it's an image we use in multi, many places, not just, not just in yeah, Genesis, for instance. That's the most famous one. R right. Rabbi, can, can I, yeah, can I, there's this story about the Gra about the Vilna Goan, who tells the story of Yonah, the prophet Jonah, who is the dove, Yonah is the dove. And the dove, and in his story, the dove represents the, the soul who is given a, 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 a task. The soul doesn't want to go ahead with his task, runs off to Las Vegas, okay? And then, you know- Nothing wrong with that. No. We, know, we, know, we know that the, 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 the ship is the body. So the, the dove is the soul. The ship is the body, um, the whale is death. And then after he basically experiences death, he goes ahead and completes his mission. Nice. Very nice. It's an interesting connection between Yonah and Noah I never thought of that. Like he's, Yonah, like, like David said, means dove oh. and he's sent out from a boat. 
Like there's like a the dove being sent out from a boat is an interesting echo. I yeah. thought I thought that Yona possibly in the boat was actually in the Leviath in the in the Leviathan. And then he's he's being he's sort of like in captured in that and then sent out from that. And that's the soul in the body. He's the soul and he's in this large you know, I don't know, brooding omnipresence, the body. But I guess not. Yona, the one has got some great stuff. I'm going to I'm going to go with David's stuff on it today just because it fits in nicely with what we're doing. Well, you know, it was Esther Youngrice who actually were in her book where I read the story. And so it was just said that okay. just, just to give credit to where credit is due. Very nice. Very nice. There's some great stuff on, on, on the book of Yona, but we'll, we'll leave leave it at that for now but um okay let's continue what is about the, the dove which is written and she did not return to the verse 12 in genesis chapter 8 no one knew where she had gone but she returned to her place and was hidden away in this opening, and she will take the crown in her mouth and place it in the Mashiach, touching it. The uh, then it is written, you will set. On his head, a crown of pure gold. Okay, note 86, that uh, please. Note 86, and she did not return to him again. First time Noah sent the dove, she found no resting place for her foot and returned to the ark, for there was water all over the earth. The second time, seven days later, the dove came back to him towards the evening. And look, a plucked olive leaf was on its bill. And Noah knew that the waters had abated from the earth. The following verse reads, he waited still another seven days and sent out the dove and she did not return to him again. According to the Zohar, having completed her mission, the dove returned to the heavenly tower, waiting there for her messianic role. The crown hovers just above the Messiah's head or barely touches his hair. The phrase mate vila mate, uh, touching it, not touching, appears elsewhere in the Zohar to describe the highest stages of emanation. That's a great phrase. Mati vila mati, yeah. Okay. Page 84. As soon as the King Mashiach reads the Torah scroll, the two eagles will rise, one on the on either side. The Yona Mayach Umalka Mashiach Nachis. No lowering herself. The King Mashiach descends with the crown on his head to the last level. The Itra Reshe Adaga Besro is Rain Nisharan Parchin Leila Reshe. The two eagles fly above his head. The Yona Tovas La Atara Bapuma, the Kavan La Elaine train Nisharan. Dove returns with the crown in her mouth, the two eagles welcoming her. Doesn't sound how eagles usually interact with doves. Is, is any of this uh, partially the source for um, when you read in the Torah, you have one person on one side and one on the other, like the two eagles? Exactly. Oh, so, thanks. Um, I just thought it's so that you could jump on the Valkar when he makes a mistake on either side. <laughs> <laughs> I thought okay, I thought maybe it's just for Simchat Torah, you know, you want to pour water so that way it looks like it's typical. So you do the whole year just for that one time. Maybe. I guess this is more likely than but who knows. 87, King Messiah Azev. 87. King Messiah descends from, on high, from high in the tower to its bottom level. Uh, the dove removes the crown from the Messiah's head and returns to its place in the middle opening of the tower. 
Okay, back to the main text. King David is called the Verdin. David Malka Zayas Radon Ikre Kame Kuchabrechu. The presence of the Blessed Holy One, as it is written. I am like a verdant olive tree. I don't have any idea what verdant means. That it's it's green. Green. Yeah, David. Olive tree in the house of God. Psalm says a verdant olive tree is King Mashiach, son of David. And that is what this dove intimates in the days of Noah, as it is written. And look, a plucked olive leaf was Bafia in her mouth. Plucked and snatched that olive leaf for his glory. How? Bafia with her mouth. And he receives glory from this dove. Tarf, he plucked rather than Tarfa, she plucked. Valiantly and prevailing. In the Heavenly Academy, it is taught Yona, a dove, is masculine. Yet since it is called Yona, it is sometimes written as feminine, and sometimes as masculine as when it receives this glory. Right. Okay, let's let's read. Uh, can you read note eighty nine? Eighty nine. Oh, eighty eight and eighty nine. Oh, yeah. eighty eight. Right, right. Um, eighty eight. King David, the progenitor of the Messiah, is called a verdant olive tree, while the Messiah himself is David's offshoot, an olive leaf. In the aftermath of the flood, the dove picked, plucked an olive leaf, signifying a wreath to crown the Messiah. According to Midrashic tradition, the dove brought the olive leaf from the Garden of Eden. Uh, the full verse in Genesis reads, the dove came back to him toward evening, and look, a plucked olive leaf was in her bill, and no one knew that the waters had abated from the earth. Okay. 89. Why is it written, Taraf, he plucked? Um, as mentioned in the previous note, the verse reads, the dove came back to him toward evening and look, a plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. Although in this verse, the word taraf functions as an adjective plucked, the Zohar uh, construes it here as a masculine verb. He plucked an olive leaf. In the Heavenly Academy, it was taught that the dove sent by Noah was masculine, but since the word Yona, dove, is not normally female, feminine, elsewhere in this biblical passage, it appears with feminine verbs and suffixes, whereas here it appears with masculine verb taraf, he plucked an olive leaf, befitting the valiant act of obtaining the messianic leaf. Uh, the formulation, yet since it is called Yona, is sometimes written as feminine and sometimes as masculine, derives from Rashi on this verse. Okay, wow, interesting. It, it, isn't this, Rabbi, where, um, you know, Shabbos, likewise, you know, where Shabbos comes in, is that Shabbos comes in in feminine form, and it leaves Malava Mal Mal Malka, means really the king, right, in a, um, Aramaic. Um, and so it leaves, it leaves in, in masculine form. Okay, good. So here it's the Yomna is generally feminine, but it's in this particular instance, it was a male because it acted masculine or it was in fact a masculine dove. Okay. Interesting. Very old school in terms of gender roles here, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, the, maybe the focus of the end is really because it's it's the Zachar king. It's the the end of the Shabbat that starts bringing the next Shabbat, and so that's the job of the male to assist the female to actually create the Shabbos. So it's 
that maybe that's why the male is the end and the female is always the creator of the project, you know, the ultimate, the actual creator of the thing, but in order to create, so it's not so much the end, it's the, because the end is the, is the beginning of the next beginning. Yeah, and I think in the Cluster Valley, which is to ferret Yesod and, um, and Malhut, which is the, 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 the center <laughs> valley, which is, in my view, grapes, olives, and dates. Um, Yesod equals the olive tree, which is the masculine, which is, we, we understand it as, as, the, as the male reproductive organ. What about, what about figs? Figs, figs is based, no, figs other than Newton is figs is most, is Netza, which is, is Moses. Yeah, oh, there you go. Okay. Does Newton mean fig? Well, no, there's a, there's a cookie, which actually I think has OU on it, which is called a fig Newton. Fig Newton. Okay. Here, here. But that, that's the rabbi's question, I think. Is yeah. it, is, <laughs> this, why is it a fig Newton? <laughs> Because, <laughs> because you guys, you guys have to have a lot of a lot of endurance, including me and your group. <laughs> okay, it's not paced off, so we can talk about fig newtons. Okay, eighty-five. When this tower returns to its place, Migdal to da katavli asre nayer can hear the ain of the shemsha. It shines like the radiance of the eye of the sun. As it is written in the Psalms, his throne is like the sun before me. But after Kursia Achra Lehevile Benison Vaasan Ravarvan. Though he will have another throne with great miracles and wonders. We'll go to, on the top of this tower are birds of fire. Bereish Migdalda is often the Nur the Kamitsafts upon Katsomak Tsafrat Sitsufa Din Imu. Chirp at morn as morning rises, a lovely chirping, whose loveliness is unmatched by any melody. The less ni imu beniguna kahuni imu. La ewa mikulu zina nacharanen. Above them all, other species. The shafnina nacharanen de kaparchen baavira. Turtle those flying in the air, ascending, descending, descending, ascending, never settling down. Keep so, okay. Small letters and great letters fly amongst them. Okay, we'll probably see what the small letters and big letters are referring to. Note 90 and 91, Zev, please. Okay, and, and after these notes, I'm going to have to excuse myself. No problem. Um, but 90 says, uh, when this tower returns to its place, after King Messiah reads from the Torah, see above notes, the full verse in Psalms um, recording God's promise to King David reads, his seed shall be forever and his throne like the sun before me. 91, small letters and great letters. On these two sets of letters, see elsewhere in the Zohar. So it's not a very... Uh, uh, yeah. We could go look those up, but yeah, we'd have to do that to know. Does it give a page? Does it give a page references to where um, you should see elsewhere in the Zohar? Yes, yeah. it does. Um, it, one three B, which is very early on. Um, also, uh, one fifty three B, and in, in two, a number of places, it cites Zohar Chadash as well. Uh, but but this this page is uploaded to the the Google Drive. You can. You can see all the, the page references in detail there. Right. There, just as a matter of interest, that um, the Rebbe brings a story down about how the phoenix, the bird of fire, um, was found on the ark, right? Mm. And um, the, the phoenix, um, um, Rabbi, help me out here, right? Yeah, what about it? Well, just can you confirm that the firebird was I uh, not more confirmed? <laughs> <laughs> if I trust you, okay. if you're asking me, if you're not sure, then I'm not sure. But if you're sure, I'm with you. No, no, I, I actually I have read about it on Chabad dot uh, dot org. And it's certainly um, a fact. I'm not I'm <laughs> good. I'm totally down with it. 
I didn't. Uh, yeah. But there's a concept yeah. no reino in arrival, which means if you didn't see something, doesn't mean it's not the case, you know. The phoenix also comes up in Harry Potter. This I've mm -hmm. seen the movie. Yeah, this is true. That I can say. I can verify that. <laughs> and, and phoenix it also appears in Arizona. Right. Well, fe fe the word phoenix is, is relates to Phoenician. Hey. Or, the, or or Lebanon. Oh wow! Wow. Yep. Interesting. I, I wonder what these flying eagles. That that's a big theme here. Is these flying eagles here, and even in the story of Rav Masifta of this person that turns into an eagle. Um. Rav Eli. Yeah. When uh, page eighty five. I did that. Um, where am I up to? On the top of this tower are birds of fire who trip in. So, sorry to cut in. Just good night, everybody. I'm, I'm uh, signing out here. Thank you for talking. Night, Zev. Good night. Take care, Zev. Oh, holy pious ones. When the yeah. letters fly, a person sees written in great letters in the air momentarily. What does he see? Voracious bar lokim as hashemayim v'sa'aretz. In the beginning. Sir by Vir lofam shata, voracious bar lokim as hashemayim v'sa'aretz. B'chei asvan z'iron bahu. Small letters strike them and then fly. Parachin v'schazi minayu k'siv. And then v'aretz hashetel v'vav choshech b'nei tehom. The earth is wet. Small letters in return and strike them, and they're seen as is written in them. God's love. The eyes to the act of these letters, happy the people who await them, all of these. Ted, why don't you read note 92? Ew. This this sounds a lot like the uh, cows eating cows, the fat oh, ones, the, the small ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ninety two. Um, oh, holy pious one. Again, the spiritual messenger addresses Rabbi Shimon. See above. On seeing letters momentarily in the morning sky, see Zohar, various references. Genesis reads in full: the earth was waste and empty, with darkness over the abyss and the wind of God hovering over the face of the waters. The following verse may be implied here as well. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Um, Genesis reads in full, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide water from water. Mm. Okay. So, you know, the way the Lurianic kind of reading of this, maybe a valid reading. I mean, that's always a valid reading, but I'm just saying maybe the best shot is that um it, it's similar to like that greek concept of dialectic um that that, that each each mimer each utterance divine utterance is kind of crashing into the other one and that's the way that takes something that's very like uh just or just light and starts giving it more substance so to speak by the by the you know this idea of the thesis and the antithesis and the synthesis that's kind of what that's kind of a, a lurianic reading of this section of the czar that fits in with other czars as well um so does that mean the small letters are really the kalim uh, if uh, a lot of stuff on I, I i'm kind of tired tonight i don't know why i mean i do know why i'm just tired all all the time now uh, I get tired in the afternoon, but today I didn't have time to get tired, so I'm tired now. So, so um, there's a lot of great stuff on the big and small letters. I'm just not really mentally able to like get into it right now. But um, but it's actually also connected. The uh, Nachman talks about how it's connected to the mimer and the chazi mimer. The, o, the, the the big and the small letter is connected to the idea of like an utterance, the utterance of the concept of a semi, like a, a partial half of an utterance. So here you have this concept here of 
these small letters um, going, you know, striking against one another. And each time that, that they strike against one another, that creates a third reality. We'll call that the Kalim, the vessels. Okay. Let's continue. A holy pious ones. Whoever places himself behind him while he is in front. Now you might ask, who protects him from behind? Well, the greatest and highest protection guards him. Who is that? Bounding love. So he enters between righteous one and righteousness. Okay, let's read the note. Uh, Ted, read note 93. Okay, 93. Oh, oh, holy pious one. This paragraph of the next are out of place and fit better with the material appearing below. It notes 107 to 116. Whoever guards the covenant of circumcision by avoiding sexual sin places himself behind Shekinah, known as righteousness, who leads the way for him. Meanwhile, who protects him from behind? None other than Yisod, known as righteous one. That says uh, on, on Yisod, see various sources. Okay. Thank you, Ted. That's great. We'll just read one more little paragraph on the top of 86. Happy is the one who preserves the co this covenant. Therefore, all males of Israel can preserve the sign of the covenant. Appear who can possibly harm a son who is in the middle. His father... That is when he is after Havaya Deuteronomy. Okay, one more note, uh, Ted, please, 94. Okay, um, 94. Therefore, all males of Israel should appear at the temple in Jerusalem during the three pilgrimage festivals. See Exodus, uh, three times a year, all your males shall appear in the presence of the Lord, and so on. The divine father is Yesod, while the mother is Shekinah, the full verse in Deuteronomy reads, after Yudkevavke, your God shall you go or walk, and him shall you revere, and his commands shall you keep, and his voice shall you heed, and him shall you worship, and to him shall you cleave. Great. Thank you, Ted. Thank sure. you. Ted. I'm going to stop this, the live stream.